Hi, welcome back to the channel. Um, I thought today, because we're in isolation, I spend a little bit of time chatting about what we can do, what we can't do. A lot of people um, during this coronavirus are moaning about we can't go out, we can't do this, we can't do that. Don't think about what you can't do, because you can't change it. Think about what you can do. And martial art training, wing chun training is something that you can still do. Yes, you can't do chi sao, very hard, to, you can't do partner work, you can't get feedback from your instructor directly. But with technology today, um, we've got Zoom, we've got Skype, we've got YouTube, we've got lots of technologies where we can share as best as we can 2D um, elements of Wing Chun. We know it's a 3D interactive, close protection, close quarter, get in close to your partner uh, type of martial art. It's a, it's a very, very close quarter thing, but that's not available. And it's a 3D thing, showing you shapes and, and, and positions from um, a camera is very, very different to a human able to walk around and look at it and position it, but it is better than nothing. So let's think about what we can do, think about some, some what we can train in isolation, think about the elements that we can benefit from, because if we work through our forms, Sinim Tao Cham Q Pew G, wooden dummy, knives, maybe even the pole, as we're training through these, doing some drills, working on the wall bag, as we're working through these, we can refine our shapes, we can refine our positions, and it should be, at the, by the time this is over, and it will be over, by the time we're all released and actually not, you know, breaking the, the isolation that's so important to keep everybody safe, your form should be perfect. That will only happen if you use your mind as well as train your body. Sunim Tao translates as the way the little idea, Su means small, little, decreasing. Nim is a thought or an idea, and Tao or Tao is a, is, a, is a method. So it's the way the little idea form. The little idea is to focus not just to go through movements without thinking, just very, very loose and, and, and imprecise without purpose, but to actually make what you do valuable, draw information from it. And we've got so much time on our hands that, that that's something we can all do. Uh, even my life, I, I still, I'm still working five days a week. I'm one of the very lucky ones, I have a very good job, a very good company I'm working for. Um, I'm now doing Zoom for my online members who are uh, still continuing thankfully to support the school and, and, and pay by standing orders so for that I am now doing a zoom online teaching three nights a week so I don't have a lot of time myself I never have had a lot of partner time even in the early years of training from 79 through to today you know my teachers all have been a long long way ago, since 1989 certainly traveling to Hong Kong was, was a luxury something that I could do some of the time but not all the time so a lot of my training has had to be solo so to improve myself I've, worked, I've learned to focus on forms. Now, I'm gonna go through a little bit of movement about Sunim Tao today, and in subsequent videos, we'll cover a few other little things. Um, for me, it's not about knowing the form. You can learn that from YouTube badly, but you can copy it and emulate it. That's not what learning is all about. Learning is about developing skill, knowledge, energy, structure, and understanding how it works. I still see Wing Chun instructors, uh, and I don't mean to criticize anybody, but teaching things that are not practical. For example, in Chang Q, you see people teaching this in, in, the, in the form. And how, how is that ever going to work against an opponent coming in? What are you going to do? Toss a pancake and scare them to death? In application, for example, if a punch is coming in, the best block in the world is to move. So the first thing you do is position yourself on the outside. If you're going to use the, the top side jutsu application, the jigsaw application, then you're going to do a lapse out and your hand is going to come forward, control the elbow, and then you're going to move. You wouldn't stand in front of somebody and do this. Because if that's a blade, well, even if it's not a blade, to be fair, but if it's a blade or a glass or a key or a screwdriver or a fist, how is that standing directly in front of it going to stop you getting hurt? It's not. So the first thing you would do is move out the way anyway. And then secondly, lapse out is always done using the jutsu energy from Sunim Tao, pulling inwards this way. And from Sunim Tao, the toxal, they come forward. So they're going to move together. So if you're going to practice it, put meaning into the move. Don't drop down vertically this way. The energy doesn't go this way. The energy is going to come this way. Lapsa would come this way. Jutsa will come this way. You're using the elbow, connecting the elbow through the hips of the heel to draw the force down towards the ground. Let the, let the legs do all the work. So you're going to be pulling down. Toxa the same. It's going to come from the heels through the hip, connect, mentally connect the elbow to the heel and drive forward. So Toxa Jutsa, I would practice this way. Not that it's the way to practice it, my way is not the way, it's a way, and it's the way that I was taught. I was also taught to analyse, to think about it, to consider application. For me, when I got into Wing Chun, I was already working in CP. Um, I, was, I was working on a practical level. Chi Sao, not really that interested in. Forms, 
didn't really bother about it but I realized very soon that by practicing my form solo my shapes my positions my structures even in the isolation and the perfect world of a classroom uh, sorry a gym like this without a partner I can get towards perfection perfection doesn't exist you can always be better but if my if my if my forms movements were very sloppy and un, not mis, not understood and not um, calculated and not worked properly then a very small percentage of that would carry through to self-defense anyway and if there was no quality in the in the thing i was practicing bugger all was going to carry through at least if i could train so my positions were sharp my energy was sharp my structures were good and they were understood and in my brain i can imagine what i was doing with them a percentage of that would then carry through to application so the, the, the more precise i am in a form the better i'm going to be in application the sloppy around the same thing applies so rather than going through the form today what i'm going to talk about is just some of the shapes that i emphasize that i work that i think about and also um, hopefully you'll have a go at as i say the sequence of sudden tower chamki buji that i was taught if yours is different it's different you know we could learn the alphabet from a to z as we all do at school and whatever school you go to in the uk and i assume in any other english speaking country you lose you use the same alphabet but you could learn it from z back to a it wouldn't make your language any worse it just makes moving from school to school a little bit more challenging so for me the form sequence is just that it's a string of techniques not necessarily linked together a b and c are not in the alphabet because they have to be next to each other they just are there's not a sequence there. there's not a word there's not a conversation um and the same with the, with some of the techniques in sunim tau chamki buji that and the, and the other forms they're not linked together necessarily because it's a sequence or a flow they're linked together because it's just a, a natural flow for the form and that's how it's always been done and for me it's not about questioning the sequence do it how you do it but look at the shapes within it and am i getting the best out of it that will give me the best use of energy the best precision the best shapes the best structure the best use of energy the best use of relaxation engaging the appropriate muscles disengaging the appropriate muscles and giving you benefit uh, and that benefit is good for health it's good for mental focus and it's also good for practicality whether it's in chisa whether it's in self-defense whether it's in combat doesn't matter um so the first thing i want to talk about in, in sunim tau um is the second section i'm gonna i'm gonna dip dip into little things just to give you some ideas of the sort of things that i play with so if i if, so assuming i'm at my basic stance i mean you give me a mile from here the first thing that i see a lot of people do is turn the hand over and drive down and they drive down all the way from here and the problem with that is if you're not careful because you're putting energy and you're thinking about the hit too early then as you start the move it becomes pivotal your hand will pivot and slap and yes it'll end up in the right place but it's got there with an inefficient path and it'll all be at form and it's sterile from any application everything you practice is you know what you train is what you'll fight how you'll fight so let's get let's do it right think about what we're trying to achieve first of all the second section is about farging that short sharp release of energy not committing yourself too early which this slappy flappy action would do exactly that Secondly, it's about knowing how to structure it. Everything is elbow driven. It's about how we contract the triceps to extend the arm at the right time, the right place, and how we disengage the biceps so the, the, the antagonists are not resisting our movement and therefore slowing us down. So in the second section of Sundum Tau, we turn the hand over, we relax, we relax, and we relax, and I wait till my elbow gets predominantly behind my wrist or as close as I can, then we snap it out. And I mean, snapped it out, I relax because it's done its job. And then I switch off and also repeat on the other side. When you bring your hands around after that and your hands touch here, don't extend. Short, sharp little hit. OK, don't worry about the practicality of it, of the actual application. Think of the practicality of the movement. If I turn my back to the camera a second, if I hit with here, I can hit with the heel of the palm. If I extend my arms, my arms will go to the width of my body. They've got to. So it's a very short, sharp little hit. I tuck it in. I bring my hands around and then I relax and the same thing I snap the wrists out at the end so from bringing them around from here I bring them around I turn the fingertips up because I want to make sure that I'm hitting using the end of these two bones when I hit something I want to hit with these two points here that's where the force is there's no force in your fingertips you'll just break your fingers there's no force at the top of the hand it will flex and sprain the wrist hitting with a palm strike if I can just get a, a little tool to show you the idea Hitting with the palm strike is like hitting with the end of two cricket stumps or carly sticks or whatever it is. That's the hit. 
that's what you're jamming them with. The end of the two bones, they just happen to be covered in a bit of flesh in a joint. So when, forgive me disappearing off screen. So when you're hitting, you're thinking about that point. With the gum sow, that's what you're thinking of. So when you apply the gum sow, you're not gonna do it with the fingertips. You're not gonna do it with the, hit, the middle of the palm that's gonna carry on. Like pack sow here, if you did pack sow here, the wrist wants to carry on. There's nothing stopping this wrist traveling, but your, your fingers or your palm is gonna stop and the wrist is going to bend it underneath. It's going to sprain your wrist. Just use the heel of the palm. That's where the power is. So if you take the thickness of your wrist and transpose that onto the front of your palm, that's the power base. That's the bit that's got the work. These fingers just happen to be there, you know, um, separate us from monkeys and do, and do some grip, grappling and gripping and poking and writing and stuff like that. But the, the, the hitting element of it here, not only is it protect here, but it's, it's the powerful bit. So in the gum sow, that's what you're looking at. Get, let's get that aligned, get the bones as, almost as, as in line as we can and let the skeleton and the muscle groups do the work and then switch it off. Do it around behind and then we come around in front and the same thing. We snap it out, okay? And then we switch it off, okay? When you do fax out from here, okay? Some people will tell you to have your arms separated. Some people have to say you should, you, your arms can touch. Some will disagree with the other. Do you know what? Get a life because it doesn't matter. It's not a fighting application. You're not going to be walking around like this. You're going to do this in a fight. It's a position ready to allow you to practice something. The thing you want to practice is a faxau. Faxau is used to go across the top of an object, above something that's taller than you, to draw something down, to drive upwards. However you apply it, this position is just a starting point. It's a reference point. Okay. When I learned it, I learned to put the left hand on top, faxau, right hand on the other way up. And I've had students and people ask me, well, why left on top? Why not right on top? And to quote my teacher, if you started right on top, you'd be asking me, why is right on top and not left on top? It, whichever you do, somebody's going to ask why you don't do it the way around. Does it really matter? I don't think so. I think, you know, other than the fact that when I'm teaching, I want everybody to do exactly the same. So there's not an inconsistency in class. We just keep it the same because it's not that important. There are more important things in life than we're, and, and Wing Chun than this. So from here with facts out, the key, to, the key is to keep your elbows up, keep your elbows up, parallel, don't drop the elbow, relax, let the shoulders, the elbows come behind the shoulder, relax, relax, snap it out, nothing. Okay, so on the side, what you're doing is you're using your shoulder as your centre line and you're relaxing and you're relaxing, and you're not putting any tension in yet and you let the elbow come round behind the shoulder align the wrist up so now i've got my shoulder lining through my wrist and even at this point my arm is too parallel to the camera so i keep it relax i relax and when my elbow predominantly comes in behind that's when i snap and then i come back and i don't worry about how my arms come back because it has no meaning and no purpose i'm trying to give purpose to something that has just to try and answer a question so students go well why do you do this and some, some instructors going you know it really doesn't matter it's just putting my arm in a position to do a technique they will try and go, oh, well, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm doing an inside chop. And I hear all people trying to fit examples around movements that actually don't matter. For example, in Chum Q, I was taught from here, when I'm stepping with the Chum Q, and I step with the, 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 the Biomar Bong Sao, I do the Bong Sao, I relax. Because the key is doing the Bong Sao. I've had people, I've heard people go, oh yes, but if you drop your arm down, it's a block and stuff like that. Or the reason you're doing the technique is to block low. No, the reason they're doing the technique is you want to practice Bumar Bong Sao. To do it again, it's not going to work if I just shuffle. To practice it again, I have to go out of the position because I'm practicing the path and transition that I'm, I'm doing. I relax. I do the path and the transition I'm doing. It's that movement that is the key within that section of Chamku. It can be practiced on here. I can practice, I've only got two arms, unfortunately, not my jong, as it, as it, as it, as it does. But I can go Bumar Bong Sao, relax. Do my bong sao, relax. Do my bong sao, relax. Turn. Do my bong sao. Do my bong sao. Do my bong sao. Turn. One, two, three. And I can try that. But the movement, this movement here, isn't a secret technique, isn't a magic technique. It has no real purpose. It's not to say it's completely useless. If somebody did manage to come underneath, would I leave my elbow high? No, I wouldn't. I'd drop my arm down. So is it, but it's not its purpose. It's a byproduct. It's something that I would naturally react to but trying to give meaning to stuff that doesn't have meaning or has the ultimate, um, ultimately no meaning of value, 
no point. Don't try and, you know, as, as instructors, we should be honest. If it has no purpose, say so. Again, the same thing as when we're doing Sinim Tower. And I remember people saying, well, when you do the punch, why do you always start with left first? I remember asking the question myself to my teacher. And I expected some, you know, it's yin and yang, it's male and female. You do one extra punch with the left because it's the weakest hand. Blah, blah. And he just basically said, well, you know, if you start with the right hand, you'd be asking me why we start with the right hand. You've got to start with one of them. So it just happened with the left. Maybe there's some deep seated meaning. I don't, I, I don't know all the answers, but I've never been given a reason. And when people have tried to give me a reason, it's all been very fluffy and philosophical and, oh, you know, it's... Uh, I don't know. I, I, I try and keep things very simple. Most people don't want to go to that, that depth. Those that do, take my hat off to you. Fantastic, unfortunately. You know, I, I, I like to keep it on a, on a practical level. I call it simply Wing Chun because it's simply Wing Chun.